Hey, this is Ryan. And this is Steve, and you're listening to 60 Cycle Hum, the guitar buying, selling, trading, modding, fixing, breaking, reviewing, playing podcast. Nice and smooth, Steve. Good yeah. delivery. It's this water. Oh, it's the water that helped, huh? I'll, it's because I'll I'm, try it's, some my water. I'm, it's because I'm practicing for my career in voiceover. <laughs> <laughs> you were telling me about that. And then you went and looked at like everyone else's voiceover portfolios. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's like, hi, I'm John Baker. Maybe. And I'm a voiceover artist. And- maybe you should go for it, though, because you'll have a different spin on things. I was thinking about that. Yeah. I just want to be like, hey, I can read stuff. You got stuff to be read? Let me read it. You do have the better voice here on the podcast, Steve. I, I, I mean, don't know if I'd I I wouldn't go that, out for doing voiceover stuff. I think everybody... With my mush mouth. I think everybody can do voiceover work. I think it's just that... Every, like, except for people who can't talk. Right, right. That's true. Or people probably who can't read. But I'd say that people who know sign language are probably more employable than people who can talk as far as using their skill of talking. Broadly... I thought you were going to say probably, but then you said broadly. (laughs) Anyway, what's new, Ryan? What's new with me? I've got some new stuff in. Um, The people over at at Graph Tech saw my rubber chicken video Mm -hmm. where I put a microphone in the mouth of the rubber chicken. Yes. And I ran it through a bunch of effects. (laughs) And they wrote me and they're like, we love this video. This is fantastic. Can we send you our tuners? (laughs) It's like, sure, that's random. I'm glad we're on your radar all of a sudden. Yeah, I could throw some tuners into something. So they actually have this really interesting set of tuners that they sent me. They're a locking tuner, but that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is that every single tuner is a different ratio. Right. For the purpose of making it so that the way they explain it in their in-house video is that if you turn one of the keys on every single string halfway around 180 degrees Mm -hmm. it'll be the same amount of like tuning drop or raise on every string which wouldn't happen if you have a different if you have the same ratio on every tuner so it's like if you're someone who you ever seen someone perform and they do like a quick string drop as part of their performance sure and like they drop the like the a Uh sure you'll be able to know exactly how it's going to drop and come back for every single string. It'll be the same muscle memory for every single string. Oh, so you're saying if you wanted to drop a half tone, like every string would be like a full turn. Right. Okay. I was thinking more practically, like if you broke a string, you really only had to, you would only... You have to memorize how many turns there are. No, so like if you broke a string, you'd really only have to retune one string. Because once you retune one string, it would be the same number of turns for all your other strings to retune your guitar. Sure. Assuming. I guess. Assuming I that guess. All I this... don't think I'm following you. So like, you know how when you break a string on a guitar, your entire guitar falls out of tune because it, you change the tension yeah. on the neck. So the idea is that like, assuming that all of the strings lose like the same amount of tension, then it would require like the same number of turns on each tuner to bring the guitar back into tune. So you'd really only have to tune oh, one string. And if you're like, that's okay, a pretty it, abstract it took me like two turns to get my low E back right. into tune. So in theory, I think that would work. I don't know because there's so many forces at play there. Sure, sure. Because you're equalizing the pressure against the neck. And every time you turn tune up a string, it's a different amount of pressure that you're equalizing. Right. So I don't think it would work, Steve. I'm sorry. Fine. Yeah. But this is a pretty interesting concept. i trying to decide, and you guys can help us in the comments section, either on YouTube or on the Facebook group. Uh, should I put these into the Telecaster, the Squire Telecaster that I have hanging uh-huh. back there, or should I put it into the Jazzmaster? I like the idea of the vintage tuners on the Jazzmaster, but if I'm honest with myself, the Jazzmaster has the most tuning issues just by way of being a fender offset. Right. Uh, and having tuners that are maybe smoother and maybe have this unique functionality to them might improve that guitar for me. But then uh, the Telecaster is going to end up being such an upgrade bucket that I mm-hmm. might as well throw these on there to like complete the process. Right. So well, that's what I'm wrestling with right now. Well, why don't we just uh, why don't we just throw it out to the comments? Yeah. Uh, if you got some ideas on that. I should say what the ratios are just for fun. The low E 
is going to be 39 to 1. Uh-huh. The A is 24 to 1. The D is 20 to 1. Um, it looks like, depending on whether you get acoustic or electric, there's different ratios. For electric, there's 35 to 1 on the G string. It's interesting that it jumps back up. Yeah. Uh, the B string is going to be 20 to 1, same as the D. That's interesting. And then the E string is 12 to 1. Pretty wild stuff. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how these actually perform. We also, in that box, got this little thing of dry and glide. Yeah. From Graph Tech. Uh, it's like a little old school like deodorant roller sort of concept, only it puts uh, like talcum powder on your hand so you can smooth, like smoothly go up and down the neck, I guess. Yeah, you need that. I, I need that. I've got a sticky hand. And they sent us some picks that are made out of their tusk material. So I'm interested yeah, in, in interested checking in that this. out. Um, they're really, I can just tell in the bag that they're pretty stiff. But I think it's a I mixed use, pack. Like, a Some of them might be lighter than others. Some of them are, but I'm saying they're all like stiffer for uh, the, like, the size. It says sure. tusk I don't know, the yellow ones. have a high stiffness to thickness ratio for a smooth, balanced feel and clean articulate attack. So I'm actually really interested in, in comparing these I'm two. I'm going to open one up right now and see how uh, it feels in my hand. To like the acrylic picks that I'm used to using. You use those thick acrylics? Yeah. These feel like plastic. That's interesting. Well, uh, it's tusk. I know, I know. Yeah, I'm going to have to try these out and see how I feel about them. They definitely feel like they're different from any other pick I've ever used. Mm. So looking forward to that. All right, you got anything new, Steve? Yeah, I ran a half marathon last Sunday, which isn't yesterday. You didn't feel like doing the whole thing? Uh, no, it was only half Freaking marathon. lazy, was, dude. I know, man. I should have just turned around and run all the <laughs> way mean, back if to you're the not gonna, starting line. If you're not going to commit, you know. Yeah, turn around and, and go back, and then you run a full one, right? I wonder what they would have done, because my car was at the starting line if they were like... It makes sense. If you got to like, go back anyway. You just cross the finish line, and you're like, oh, hold on, I got to go get my car. And you just start running the other direction. Doubled up, do a full, you know? <laughs> that would have so been how was that? Good. Is that your first uh, time ever doing that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if it's going to be my last. Um, it's pretty It doesn't far. sound like it's definitely not going to be your last it sounds like it might be your last i don't know um it wasn't it wasn't awful All it right. was actually like it wasn't that bad but it, do you feel like it's something you need to do again or want to do again it would probably depend i'm the, so this was the have you put the sticker on your car yet that says no what you ran no no i'm not i'm not that guy um <laughs> thank god uh, sorry runners out there so the first audience. the first one this was the from coronado to imperial beach so it's pretty flat. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one in the spring called the Beach and Bay. So it's like, I think from like PB and then, or no, I think it's just around Mission Bay because yeah. around Mission Bay is like 12 miles. Oh, is it really? Yeah. So it's like around Mission Bay and then a little extra. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about that one. I feel like it's not fair that people run marathons and half marathons and get to do it in pretty places. And then they, <laughs> they brag about how hard it was. Like you ran through like some pretty like beautiful areas, like places tourists go and ride their bikes around like, right. casually and people jog it every day. I feel like if you're going to run a marathon, it should have to be through like a black tube underground <laughs> where you don't see anything. And it's just about running. You don't, well, get, you don't get any pleasure from it. I will say like that was the hard thing. And with this particular one, you kept wanting is, to stop to um, see the sights. No, is is maybe like five or six miles in, I started getting bored, <laughs> and then um, yeah, when I used to go to a gym, I'd you know get on the machine and yeah, I'd cover you know a bunch of miles or a bunch of calories or whatever. Right. But I could sit there and watch Dexter on my phone. I can't do well. I can't do <laughs> treadmills. The, the one time, actually, the last time I treadmill ran was last Nam, uh -huh. and. Um, this, you I did that. You did that at Nam. Yeah, I couldn't get the stupid TV to work. So was it in the hotel or something? Yeah. Oh, okay. The hotel had a gym. I forgot that we stayed in. Which the hotel. I'm not exactly sure how that worked out. Like taco party, drive back, check into the hotel at like 1 a.m., fall asleep at like 2:30, wake up at like 7:30, decide the only way I'm not going to feel sweat it out. The only way I'm not going to feel like garbage today is if I go run two or two and a half miles or whatever the hell it was I ran. You got to sweat out all that booze. Um, and then go back up, jump in the shower, go eat breakfast, go hit the NAM floor, drink my way through lunch. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. Nam is coming up quick. Um, so yeah, so that's one of my things. That was that was really, that was a thing. That was a thing you did. Um, I definitely, I want to recommend that distance to like everybody, but I, I do think like what distance would you recommend to everybody? I think anyone should be able to like reasonably run a five k, unless you're like not me. I think there are physical ailments that prevent people from doing it. What Otherwise, if you just I don't run so good and your body moves weird and it feels bad? That's just laziness. It's not laziness. Dude, you can, if you can surf, you can run three you miles. You use completely different limbs for that. Oh, no, it's general coordination. I've never been able to run. I've never been Also, a like, I've seen your brother. He can't be that differently bodied than you. You know, he's got longer legs than me. I got a long he torso. He does have longer legs than you, but he can also run, like, 10 I'm miles. You, I've just never been able to run. My You body... just said you used to go on the treadmill for miles the, and miles and miles. It wasn't the treadmill. It was the orbital oh, thing. Oh, okay. What are those uh, called? Elliptical. An elliptical. I would say 5K is a distance that, like... I'm not even saying, like, you can do it I fast. I can walk I'm just like, like a mofo. I can hike for... There you weeks go. And that's my weeks. next. Uh, that's my next thing is I'm gonna do the Mission Trails Five Peak. Okay. I'm gonna do it in one day. All right. So it's like 16 and a half miles of hiking. No, that's not so bad. It's not. It's like yeah. I think the times I've seen most people do it in like six or seven hours. Yeah. So as long as you start at like six and thirty, so seven. I could do that. Morning. I'm not lazy. I could do that. No problem. He asked me to run even like one k, and I'm like, it's not gonna happen. I'm, it's just never gonna happen for me. You tell me this I could is a, buy, this is I, a basic human function. Right? I could bike. I could ride a bike for what, like I'm trying to remember if ten there was hours a at a time. There was a there's a they didn't it's have not bikes. I'm not they had, ath- it's not because I'm not athletic. They had Steve. elliptigos. Have you ever seen an elliptigo? It's like an elliptical, but it's a bike. Oh yeah, it's I like have the seen bike those. version of They're an like elliptical. Super nerdy. It's really weird. Yeah. Uh, all of like the safety people were riding those, like the the race paramedics yeah i've thought about going to one of those like running places where they like analyze your running right just so they could tell me what exactly is wrong with my body i don't know i think i've only seen you run like once in the entire time i've known you it was that time bears were chasing us and everyone saw me run like all our friends were being I chased don't remember by bears this. i can't remember why you would ever see me run maybe at the beach or something i don't know yeah trying don't to know. get somewhere I definitely wasn't doing it just to like be like, guys. I'm just I can gonna run like good. hold your kid like a hundred yards away and be like, Ryan, if you don't run over here, I'm gonna punch your kid in the face. Like I can, sp- I can sprint a little bit, but it's like after a while, I'm like I can't do this anymore. I have to stop right now because things feel real bad. It's like right. it's not like a joint thing. My joints don't feel like I ha- I can get a rhythm going correctly. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I think that's just a muscle memory thing. I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, so anyways, another new thing that has more to do with gear and less to do with our bodies uh-huh. and our, our athleticism anyways, uh, we've got a new run of 50, 50 pedals oh, and yeah. not as of the day of us recording this, but they're supposed to arrive tomorrow, which will be before this episode drops. Um, so what we're going to do and what we do every time we get more 50 fifties in is that the inner circle gets first dibs. So if you have been thinking about joining the inner circle, this is your week. Uh, yeah, I'm also going a, to a membership th- drive, I guess. Throw a post up on the Patreon. I will try to remember to do that. Sure. I should just do it now. Yeah. So Inner Circle gets first dibs and they get a special price. Anything that's left over, and there's only like 25 of these in this yeah. run. So they're going to go quick. Anything that's left, we're going to put up for sale on the regular Facebook group, which you should join if mm-hmm. you're a listener and you haven't joined. Uh, so we're going to put them up for sale there until they're completely gone on Black Friday. Yeah, so basically, I'm going to say two things. Okay. If you're not in our Facebook group... This is the first thing he's going to say. If you're not in our Facebook group, you can send us an email. But if you send us an email before Black Friday, I'm just going to ignore it. Yeah, it's got to be on Black Friday that you send the email to if request one of these. You things. live in a time zone that's different than my you know time what? zone. You know what, dude? If people can't do it through the Facebook group, join Facebook to get this. If you really want it, they're gonna <laughs> sell out. Like I guarantee you, they'll they'll probably be sold out the same day as Black Friday. Oh yeah, I'm honestly wondering how many will actually be left after the inner circle gets done picking them apart. I don't know. 
You think we'll sell all of them in the inner circle? I don't think all of I them, but not. I don't think there won't. I don't think there will be a lot left. I hope we don't. I know a lot of people want them right now. It's been a while. What happened is we actually ordered these back in the early springtime. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'll do a couple orders of these this year. We'll do little mm -hmm. like limited runs with different art. And then the process to get the box printed took super, super long. And so now we just finally got them. Yeah. Also, this is special box. Yes. Yeah, new art. On new it. art. It's a, like a blackout design. Did you ever post the art? Not to the regular group, just to the inner, just circle. inner circle. So the inner circle knows what it looks like. I guess oh. I'll be putting up a picture right here in this video of what they're going to look like. <laughs> Hopefully I remember to do that. Uh, all right. Let's, should we get into regular stuff? Yeah. It's been a long intro. 16 minutes, Steve. I think that's normal. Yeah, it's pretty close to normal. You think we talked too much about stuff that'll annoy people? Probably. We All didn't right. talk about food once. We could talk hey, about food. No. We could eat uh, a bunch of carrots. So this first ad was sent in by Jason Fry. It says, this six-string electric guitar... Oh, sorry. I need to practice. This six-string electric guitar is the first of its kind to be built and sold by Apricot Music located in the beautiful forest of Pennsylvania. The neck and fretboard were built by Handcraft Guitars in Pittson, Pennsylvania, with the remainder of the construction done by Apricot. This gorgeous axe was made with quality and precision, resembling heavyweight guitar companies, yet it is relatively lightweight at approximately seven pounds. That is pretty pounds, light for this, pounds, pounds, pounds. <laughs> for this body size. Um, it has two humbucker Epiphone Hotch pickups, which are, is that a thing? I have no idea. Hot classic humbucker. Okay. Oh, hot CH. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, which are modeled after a Gibson 57 Classic pickup. This has a Floyd Rose licensed double locking trim system set as a floating bridge. And blah, blah, you know blah, what? Blah. This got a bunch of stuff. Let's you get to those look pictures. At the, look at the pictures in the link or here on the video. You can see them. Oh, it says that's a Jaguar style control plate. Yes, I. It's no, hard that's to tell. what's in the description. Sure, it says Chrome Jazz style. He says style. I still think that's off of a jazz bass. I don't. I think. I think what you said before we recorded this show is that they drilled the holes custom, which I agree yeah. with. But I think that's off the bass. Um, well, there's so much to unpack here. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on. It's a Telecaster style headstock on a body that was trying to be like a Dean, like star shape, but the lower front facing horn is trying to do like a BC rich, like pointy jagged thing. Mm -hmm. uh, something that's really messed up on it is that the, the V part of it on the tail between the two horns is the wrong shape. Like it ends too abruptly. It's supposed to be kind of rounded for, I mean, it doesn't have to be, it's not supposed to be anything. This is a custom guitar, but if he wanted it to look like the cut of. You're talking um, about like the upper The arm? crotch. That part. It's not centered. It's not centered either. Also, the shape of the lower uh, bottom horn on, on the V is, is smaller. It's a smaller yeah. point than the upper horn. This whole thing looks like it was cut out by like freehand on a table saw. Yeah. Like just the shape I mean, is so random. I, I don't think it's necessarily bad. And then the, do you want to talk about the finish? I want to know why. So if this is the first thing, so this is basically your flagship model, right? It's their first guitar, which means that this is, I mean, you look at the print on the headstock and this is home done. This, I don't believe for a minute that this is a guitar company. I think this is someone with like who built a guitar in the garage right. and they're like, I'm going to brand it apricot and that'll be my brand. This is the first one I ever built. <sighs> yeah. I, I, it looks like a home built. This guitar. is the kind of thing you build for yourself. Exactly. The, the guitar is white, but it's been completely splattered with red paint mm -hmm. to make it look like it's like a crime scene, I guess, mm -hmm. or like a murder weapon or, that like a zombie exploded all over it, I guess. There's just so much wonky about this guitar, I can't even process it. Right. Even the pickup placement. Like look how far the neck pickup is from the neck of the guitar. There's a good like inch and a half of space there. Which one are you looking at? The pickups. Oh yeah, yeah. It's almost a middle pickup. There's even a the, lot of even the bridge weird. pickup is too far away from the actual bridge of the guitar. 
the best thing about this is that there's a good looking Floyd Rose on it, and then the chrome, <laughs> and then the chrome uh, humbucker rings match everything. I don't hate the upper horn. I hate the. You mean by the upper horn? You mean the lower front horn? Right. Because right. it is a star shape. It doesn't have. It's like an explorer that had some stuff cut out of it. Correct. I don't hate that point. I think it's interesting. Enough. I don't hate it either, but there would need to be more points like that to balance it out. Like the other two points would need to have that style mm -hmm. for it to make sense to me. And then just slapping the the uh, the jazz bass or Jaguar control plate on there going backwards on that lower forward facing horn is bizarre looking with the rest of the style of this. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's cuz this isn't like a Frank been... in like funky Fender thing. This is like trying to be a metal guitar. That hardware should have just been installed direct to body. Exactly. Um as far as the <sighs> Epiphone Hotch pickups being modeled after Gibson 57 Classic. Oh God, I just looked at the price. Um that's not a thing. I'm pretty sure the Hotch pickup is um modeled after the um probably the 498t i don't hey, know we're man. talking about pickups again yeah steve Great. is showing off with his deep deep knowledge of every piece of hardware by model number that i'm kind of Gibson and their other I'm kind brands of interested in uh in what that's gonna be like though to have the same pickup in both the neck and and uh bridge position of all the things about this guitar that's gonna be the most fine thing steve it's gonna be okay you have to balance those is there anything that could be done to save this thing? Yeah, strip it. Just for parts? Well, I'm saying... Oh, I mean, that neck might be salvageable if it's a good neck. I'm saying, like, just you could strip strip the finish and put it all back together. But then and... the body's still dumb. Okay, you can... I don't know, man. Recut it. $640. There's no way. There's no freaking way. It's handmade, Ryan. It's handmade and handcrafted. We're talking about hands now? Hands. It's oh, got, my gosh. People, people put their hands people all over People put their hands guitar. on it, and that made it worth more because their hands touched it. You know, it, people's hands touch every single guitar that gets made. Mm, is that true? Yeah, that's true. You sure? Yeah. I'm trying. To I don't think, think there's a single guitar in production that was not at one point touched by human hands. Hmm. Yeah, the hands might have been putting it into the machine that cuts it or putting it into the machine that paints it. But at some point, someone held right. a right. screwdriver and put a few parts together. Fine. Fine. They put this. There's not a robot that strings Floyd Roses, as far as I'm aware. What if there was? It'd probably save a lot of time. I'd probably want to buy one. I mean, that <laughs> robot would have probably need to have hands to do that. So. That's true. Robot hands. You know, that, that's a good point, Steve. Why are we being racist against robots? You know, are robots, robots are, a species? Robots are building things with their hands. Are robots they a race? Have, if they've got hands, does that make them a species? Or a race? Inanimate objects don't have hands, Steve. Mm. Except for dolls. And they could become animate if they're haunted. Or if this is the Toy Story universe. And Ooh, we just don't yeah. know that they're alive. Okay, okay. Everything's people. <laughs> I mean that's what uh that's what the Citizens United taught decision taught us, right? Everything is, it, is people. Everything is people. What is Citizens United? I don't yeah, know what you're talking mind. about. Uh, I don't really want to talk about it. This week's okay. sponsor is we're not there yet, so never mind. <laughs> you gotta wait for the sponsor. Woo! We're not gonna give you the good good stuff right up front. Man, Steve, just jumping into it. People Yikes. gotta wait if they want to hear about the sponsor. All right, this week, actually like kind of today, maybe. Yes. yes. Um Boss came out with a bunch yeah. of stuff. Crazy stuff, too. Do we want to start with the thing that starts with an A or the other thing? Let's start with the other thing. Okay. S Steve's going crazy. We're going to start with the other the thing. Other? Wait, which one? It's called the one? Boss Tube Amp Expander. It's a Wazacraft thing. How does it, How does um this start with an A? It is an amp. Come on, that was Steve. Not... Play with me. Work in the space. Read my mind. You know how I think. I don't. You should be able to predict that. <laughs> We've been doing this for five years. 
I should have been able to say it starts with a K and you'd be able to figure it out. <laughs> that would have been closer to what it actually starts with. All right. So um, they came out with a tube amp expander. Yeah, the what tube that expander. Um, so all this is, all this is, is it's a reactive load. And uh, somebody in our group did rightly point <laughs> Re out reactive load. that uh, this is kind of the same thing that uh, Universal Audio came out with yeah, this with year with the, the aux. aux box. Did um, they come out with that this last year? I thought I saw that at Summer that Nam there? a year and a half ago. Oh, I don't know. I think it was a year and a half ago. I, I think didn't it was go to Summer Nam. But everyone has been using that aux box. I'll tell you what. It was at TGU and all the recording well, studios. Reactive loads are like a really big thing right now because people yeah, are. people want to use their tube amps, but they want to They want to plug uh, into computers. They yeah, want to they plug, want to plug into all volumes. kinds of stuff. Yeah. So the thing that this has is a big problem solving box is what it that is. That the aux doesn't and a lot of other units I've seen uh don't have is that this has like a whole bunch of different Yeah. uh expanded expanded it's the expander uh functions in terms of Im you can load impulse responses onto it um it's got reverb apparently yeah it has some internal effects apparently um it utilizes well it utilizes and we'll talk about this more with well, the next product something it utilizes about the reverb, tube logic something about the reverb uh someone pointed out in my video of the nux solid studio is that mm -hmm. it the uh, speaker emulation puts a little bit of reverb oh. on everything. So that might be a function of this, maybe having a little bit of reverb on a, like a cab emulation, like right. helps smooth everything out or something. Mm. So that might be the function there. But yeah, it's got a ton of different ways to use it and plug it in. Uh, you can control it through MIDI stuff. So if like you want different settings while you're playing, I'm assuming that's what that's for. All kinds of effects, loops, and line ins and outs and stuff. I, I feel like this is way outside our depth to be talking about it. it. It is, but I think it's like something that's really cool. The thing, the big question is, it's just kind of been announced is what the price is going to look at because this yeah. is part of the Waza line, which does tend to run a, kind of a bit more. And like the Ox, I think is $1,100, something like that. I thought it was more than that. It's, it's expensive. It's out, it's out of my price point. It's up there. Um, like I said, this does a lot. Um, it's got, I mean, the back panel of it, just looking at the back panel was, I was like, oh, wow. I'm really interested to see the price point on this. And then I'll figure out if like these things are something that I can even use around like here. The, like the effects loop is really interesting. Like you run the tube app into it. So you have post, you yeah. have like post power effects. Effects loops. Um, That's So you could be running an effect over like the affected sp speaker out, which is crazy. That's the way that I see it. Yes. There's like a completely new way to run effects. I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm like super focused here because there's a block diagram on the back. I mean, we both took looks at this while we were working today as much as we could. And now we're actually soaking it in. Well, like there's a whole block diagram of like what the oh, different things are that you can do with it. In terms of like the line out and uh, you know these different outs, so I mean there's just there's a lot to unpack, um, and the way the sims work and how they're connected and and just all kinds of stuff. It basically anyway, it has uh, recommended settings for all these different kinds of amps back here. Yeah, rectifier stack, high gain stack, Brit stack, classic stack, super combo, tweed combo, diamond amp. Uh, tweed deluxe di deluxe combo mini combo this seems like it's a pretty like brainy product mm -hmm. like this isn't for someone like me who's just gonna like turn on an amp and let it rip you know well and i think this could have some other like interesting um ways to to kind of do things because i would imagine like you could probably just if you wanted to, like you could use just the IR functions. Yeah. Plug your guitar directly into the effects loop return. Yeah, absolutely. And go that way. Well, I, like you want to, I guess you probably wouldn't plug your guitar direct in. You'd well, I'm assuming plug your guitar into a metal zone and I use that just, as your preamp. I could just use it as a load box so that I could dime uh, an amp to get it dirty, mm -hmm. but then use this to cut the volume. It'd be like an attenuator, right? I could use it to attenuate. And, re and return the signal to the, to the amp speaker. Could I do that? So that's actually, that is, 
I th you should be able to do that. Steve says I should be able to do it. I should be able to do it then. I'm going to do it, Steve. And if something breaks, it's your fault. I mean, if the purpose of this is to behave as a reactive load, that yeah, reactive load, like that would be the purpose of it is in a theory like you could run because I'm noticing, you know, there is a speaker output as well. Um, I like that we're at the point where I'm not snickering at reactive load anymore. Yeah, I didn't really get the joke anyway. That sounds like a sex thing, Steve. <sighs> Whatever. Um, the I other... kept wanting to say, like, I'll show you a reactive load yeah, or I'll give weird. you a reactive load. Nope. Um, nope. So <laughs> nope, the, other so thing, <laughs> the other thing that came out, I don't know if it came out today because I feel like maybe I think it came they out both a, a couple came days ago. Out, well, you know, when this episode drops, it's right. old news. Sure. Is the uh, Next Tone series from Boss. Two new amplifiers from them. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got so the... What, a 1x12 and a 2x12? I think so. Well, one's a 40 watt and one's an 80 watt. I've okay. got screen grabs of the 40 watt here. It looks like it's the same format and build style as the Katana series, mm -hmm. but this is much more oriented towards just being a straight ahead amp, not like fooling around with like being a modeling amp at right. all. The if there's any sort of you know modeling in air quotes, because I know it's not actually modeling section to it, is that you can select different styles of of power amp tubes. Well, at least like uh, their their emulation of it. What's their technology called? The tube logic. The tube logic, which is their technology from like the Blues Cube and things like that, mm -hmm. and obviously the technology that's been used in uh, the katanas, right? Not used in the katanas. The katana is built on Waza DNA. Oh, okay. That's like a very except for the katana artist. The katana so the, artist uses uses the tube logic circuit, but none of the. At least none of so the other. So this is like an evolution from the Katana artist. Yeah. So Tube Logic is a Roland thing that was um, used in uh, the like Hot Blues or whatever right, right. Right, those amps. Um, but the. Um, well, I watched the video of this thing and it sounded like a tube amp to me. Like. It's like definitely like design. Like that that's sound. the that is like the whole Tube Logic thing is, you know, this is a constant evolution and brands always have like their different names for it. Crate had some dumb. Crate called it Flex Wave. Yeah, I uh, remember Trans Tube with PV. PV had Trans Tube. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, different companies come up with different names for it. And I don't want to say like Tube Logic is the same thing because I don't know what it's based on. But it's the same. The fact that they use Logic makes me think that it's like a digital emulation. I don't know. Uh, that maybe like a fixed digital emulation. But here it gives you a option for a six v six. 6L6, EL84, mm -hmm. or EL34. Yes. And then there's different power controls, which is the same as a Katana where you can yeah. do standby, standby, half watt, half, and max wattage. Yeah. The uh, So on top so of that it... Would be, that would be 20 watts and 40 watts. Right. And on top of it, just kind of like the, the same as the Katana is there is like a USB out for... Um, yeah. The, for like... Uh, messing with for stuff. Messing with stuff. So this has the next tone editor... Um, it says, just connect to the next tone editor and become a virtual tech, fine-tuning bias, sag, EQ, and other internal settings to perfectly match your individual style. So it's like the, the Katana was leaning into like load whatever like three effects you want mm -hmm. and choose like different styles of like game stages or whatever. Like you do crunch, clean, yeah. acoustic. Like it's trying to be a, a Swiss Army knife in a lot of ways. This is just leaning into like different tube styles and then right. the rest of the amp is super straightforward there's no effects to be loaded um there's a master volume gain volume an equalizer uh there's a little bit of an effect there's a delay and a reverb with a tap tempo. Oh, okay that's the only built-in effects and then presence and master like sure. this is a really i i I found that I only use the clean channel on my katana the most of the time because I use it for mm -hmm. a pedal platform. Like this seems like it's more built for someone like me. Right. Right. Than like the full load out of the katana. It's also more expensive though. The 40 watt is a yeah. $500 amp compared to the $200 price tag on the katana. Which is 50 watts. 10 more 50, watts. I t there's more watts per dollar. And then the, the 80 watt version is 700, I think. Right. So I'm, I'm interested to check these out at NAMM. Um, I'm actually going to be shooting video at uh, the Delhi slash Stomp Box exhibit booth mm -hmm. for three days at NAMM. And we're, that booth is sponsored by Boss. So I'll probably be using 
one of these amps or a katana, which I yeah, love. Yeah, I, I, I know. Uh, I know they were talking about trying to do stuff. a katana, but this could be yeah a good way to get kind of like boost that coverage because now you're you'd be putting out a product that probably a lot of people are going to go to be curious about. Be curious about. They can cut words. Yeah, heads up. I mean, if you're going to Nam, you'll know where to find me this year. I'll be at the deli booth. I'll be stuck there for freaking three days shooting videos non-stop. Uh... <laughs> I didn't do it to myself. I the guy pitched the idea to me and I was like, "Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Let's do it." <laughs> I won't be walking around Nam this time. I'll be stuck in a booth. Well, you'll have you're going to have like what one day you have one day to walk Yeah, around? I don't know if I'll stick around the extra day because i got a baby here, dude. Mm. If I'm not, you know, making money, I might head straight home. I'm sure okay. I'd walk around at least a little bit on Sunday before heading back home. I don't know. We'll figure it out because I'm definitely going to do an after party on Saturday night, right? Yeah. I gotta. Probably not going to get invited. Yeah, that's true. It hasn't stopped me before. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Should we jump on to the next advertisement? No, we should talk about some sponsorships. Sponsorships? This week's episode is sponsored by Gun Street. Why You're wearing the shop? shirt. I'm wearing the shirt. Boom. Established 2015, Gun Street Wiring Shop is your premier place to get custom wiring for your Strat, Telecaster, Gibson Les Paul, Hepaphone Les Paul, SGs, <laughs> Bases, whatever, man. Yeah. Shoot them an email and say, this is the thing that I have, and this is what I want. You got something funky and do? weird? What can they you can, do for me? They can figure it out for you. They've uh, made stuff for both of us so far. They're going to make stuff in the near future for us. We like them. Everyone else who's gotten them likes them. They make a great product. Yeah. The instructions that you get with the kit are really easy to follow. Everything's wired. Like, literally, it's all you're taking is their wires, yeah. connecting them to your wires, a little bit of solder, and you're done. My biggest thing still is that it's a huge time saver. I don't think I'll ever try to wire up, like, an SG ever mm. again from scratch because it turned what would normally be, like, a full Saturday project into a, a lunch hour project. Right. Dropping in yeah. a pre-wired SG harness. You know, harness. you say that, but I literally did dropped in the harness on my Telecaster during my lunch break. During your actual lunch break. Like, I think I, I actually did mine on my lunch break, too. Like, as much as you can have a lunch break when you're self-employed. But you know what I mean. I did it, like, in an hour yeah. while I was eating a sandwich. It was easy. Yeah. Even with my crappy soldering iron. <laughs> All right. This week's uh, episode is also brought to you by Sinusoid. Uh, they are still featuring the uh, Panhandle Giving Cable. Um, Albert, who works for Sinusoid, is from the North Florida region, which was recently devastated by Hurricane Michael. So uh, they are doing the Panhandle Cable. Uh, all of the proceeds minus shipping and cost of goods. So basically, the, all the labor yep. um, is uh, the cost of labor is going to the North Florida Red Cross, I believe. And uh, so that's a really uh, great way to get a, a really good cable, a really great and cable. good looking cable, too. Yeah, it's uh, white with uh, Neutrik jacks. I actually have the uh, I have the Houston giving cable and that I use that thing all the time. It's classic. It's a really uh, it's a really well built cable. Um, so, yeah. Go check out sinusoid, uh, sin uh, sinusoid.com. They make cables. And smiles. And last but not least, Certainly uh, this not week. Least. Um, Which one would you say is least, Steve? Oh, don't make me choose. <laughs> None of them are least. They're all equal. We just love them differently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have the uh, this episode brought to you by Chase Bliss. I'm holding up. Their new pedal is going to be obscured by their logo at some point, I'm sure. Yeah, this is the uh, Dark World. You probably saw it teased on... If you've been on the you internet, you saw you, it teased. Well, we teased it on Instagram, yeah. But, I mean, if they're listening to this and watching this, it's already been released. Yeah, that's true. So uh, This on. is the Dark World. Um, this is a uh, dual-channel reverb. Uh, do they, does it have the new the new? Uh, it doesn't. There it is. I just checked. Oh, really? I just checked. It still says digital brain analog heart on the box. Uh, this is their first pedal with a digital brain and a digital heart. Yeah. Because mm. it's a reverb and you can't really do the things that this thing does with analog. Yeah. You have to go digital to get the crazy sounds that are locked up in this box. I just finished filming the demo today and I got to say this thing is a blast off. I'm easily saying that it's my favorite Chase Bliss pedal so far. Like awesome. Just flat out. Uh, and uh, it has a pretty nice, surfy, drippy sound to it. It's not a mm. traditional, like, full emulation of a uh, Fender unit drip. But it, right. it gets me there. 
like if I heard this on a stage, I'd be looking around and be like, what are, what are they using? Right. Where is that reverb coming from? Cause it sounds good and I like it and it's a lot of fun to play with. So go watch my demo. If you want to see everything about it, I think I'm going to do multiple videos of it. I'm going to say, even if you're not interested in this, but if you're a fan of classic video games, go to the Chase Bliss Facebook page and watch their yeah. uh, teaser video for this it's pedal. It's pretty fantastic. It is. Why well, I literally started freaking out when I saw it. <laughs> I was like at work today. I pressed play and I was like, Steve flipped his table oh, over. Oh my God. This is, this is incredible. This is the best thing I've seen like for a product launch Steve loves a long it. time. Steve loves it. Go check it out. All right. This, uh, this next, uh, ad was sent to us by Nate Nagel. Thanks, uh, Nate. it is called 70s Fender Stratocaster style custom shop style, $750. That's what it's called. That's what it's the a long name. Called. Please call Todd. All Fender, no serial number. Hand built by Fender Tech at home. Mint condition. Relic neck. Curly maple. Warm moth. Better than Fender neck. 70s Fender Stratocaster style with custom shop details. This guitar was built by a master craftsman who works at the Cal California Fender plant. Not made at plant. And it's not a plant. Even though yeah. it is made out of wood. Which is kind of from a plant. It's a little confusing. Yeah. Uh, guitar is in like new shape and body is mint and without scratches. Most people don't know all strap bodies marked made in Mexico are all made in the USA and then finished at lower cost in Mexico. Mexico body finished by ProTech. This guitar has the same build of a $3,500 to $4,500 custom shop strat. That's what he does at Fender, custom shop finisher. Save a bunch of dollar signs and enjoy all USA hardware, tweed case included. I mean, I, I'm not an expert enough to be able to say things that this person claims are wrong. I mean, we've long said that the difference between different price guitars comes down a lot to the fit and the finish, like the final yeah. skill details on it. So this guy could actually be a Fender builder who's building guitars at home, moonlighting. I hope we don't get him in trouble by talking about this and get him fired or whatever, if anyone from Fender is listening. Uh, hi, Fender, if you are listening. Uh, but it's like, yeah, even if the bodies for Mexican fenders are made in the U.S., that doesn't mean they're being made to U.S. fender specs. I just have so, okay. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot to unpack. And it's crazy that there's like the custom shop logo all over this thing. Yeah, it's... If the it's guy on the, does it's work It's on for the fender. back of the headstock. It's on... The it's like got a custom it's on shop. the neck plate. Oh, it doesn't say fender on the neck plate, it just says custom shop on that one. Um, I mean, but come on, yeah, it's like it's this it says looks, fender on the headstock, yeah, it says fender stratocaster on the headstock. Uh, the made relicking in the USA. on this is bananas. So, this is where I take this is actually where I take issue on it is okay, the body just looks like whatever. Uh, is that it looks a, like a Mexican strap? It looks body. like a Mexican strap body. It, it doesn't i feel like i'm gonna make up the scenario here i feel like what happened here is this guy went to his buddy's house who does work for fender and his buddy's like oh look at this cool neck that i've been working on in my spare time like i'm just been having fun like trying new techniques for like making like a cool look and the guy's his friend is like if i bring you a body will you build me a guitar around that neck and he's like yeah, yeah i guess i'll sell you my neck and they just slap it onto a mexican strap body so so that's my made-up scenario there's no way that's really what happened this uh, the you know the guy says that this is a warm moth neck i can neither confirm nor deny because i don't sure. know enough about warm moth necks the part that i have a problem with is he makes such a big deal about okay this guitar is built by a master craftsman blah blah blah, blah. um hand built by fender tech uh, where is it? Um, that says that's what he does at Fender parentheses custom shop finisher. The problem that I have with that is this neck looks like garbage. It looks insane, right? And it's not that it looks, it doesn't look like insane cause it's so relic. This finish, finish is a is, hack job. The finish is so goopy. Look at the finish goes over the plastic truss rod okay. ring. 
so so here's my issue with this. It, there, it looks I, like he stabbed the ballpoint pen into it a dozen I times. I don't know how to do water slide. If this is a water slide, I don't, I don't, it not, looks like a water slide. I don't know how to do water slide, but I think I can finish a headstock better than this. Oh, I for sure. I am. And a, I've never done it. I am a hack when it comes to doing like finishing stuff. I know I could do a cleaner job than this, but then it's like, that's what I was saying. I think this guy was like experimenting with relicing techniques or something like that, or some sort of idea he had. This is not, if it's a relic, it's not a good relic. Because it's bizarre looking. Now, I would buy like that this is a high quality neck because I look at the back. I mean, even the, the way back the, of the finishes... headstock and there's a lot of a lot of like bird's eyeing going sure, on. Sure, sure. No, he probably bought a nice neck from Warmoth. Even the way the, the finish is worn off of the fretboard in between the frets is bananas. No, looking. it looks awful. It's so weird. I I don't I really I would if you had shown this to me and be like, this is custom shop, I'd I'd be like, are you sure? Right. There's something really off here. And that body, the guy, I mean, just the guy's claim that like an MIM body is the same as a Mexican, as an American body. Like looking at this, I can tell this is a Mexican body. Yeah. It, well, it has to do with the finish. It's the I mean, finish. The guy's it's trying the, to make a claim. It's the wood grain too. Like certain wood grains. Yeah. It's, it's not the, the nicer. Mexican it's not the nicer wood grain. I, I think I kind of agree. I think, you know, Maybe um, something about the bridge looks cheap too. The way the the edges of the metal. I know the picture is kind of crappy and small, but like it doesn't look like a high end bridge. Yeah, I, I'm not. It doesn't even look like a Mexican bridge, really. I th I'm gonna be surprised if it's a Mexican bridge. All right. It's definitely an MIM. Like it's drilled for an MIM body. The idea, and let, I mean, I guess this could be the newer American hardware. Maybe. What is he asking for this? Seven hundred and fifty dollars. No way. Yeah. No uh, way. Maybe. I'm. I think maybe I get interested in this. This is. I would have to. I would have to feel that neck in person because the way it looks now, it looks like it's gummy and sticky. Yeah. Yeah. The and I'd be. I wouldn't be buying it to be like. Yeah, I'm getting a nice relic neck. I'd be buying it like I'm getting a functional neck that I'm going to put on something that I'm going to play, and maybe I'll try to refinish so you it said someday. like you said the headstock looks like uh you know he's, he's, he got stabbed with a ballpoint pen a bunch of times but what it really looks like is somebody was trying to install a string tree drunk but the placement of these no it 100 percent looks like a ballpoint pen like look at the end of this ballpoint pen right here it's just stabbed into random locations like it, and they're truly random locations yeah this is I just, this finish is so bad that I feel like it blows the rest of the story I up. I don't believe the story at all looking at this finish up close. I don't believe this person works for Fender. I don't believe they build other guitars. I think this is all a big mistake. I want to know how this... Either this guy got had, he got taken advantage by someone who's a liar, or he's the liar. Well, and so that's the other thing is this guitar is in Minnesota... How did it get to Minnesota if it was built by a guy who works at the Fender California plant? Because the, there's no way to transport things. I'm saying like... We all know that. <laughs> he would have to carry it in person and walk all no, the way I, from I, Minnesota I, to get there. I'm this. just saying like... I'm saying like the pitch of this story makes it sound like, oh, right. this I, is my buddy I, who lives I've down got, the street. This is my buddy. Like I've got it in. He made this thing. I'm helping. Like it almost has a, I'm helping him sell it kind of a thing. Yeah. Like as if like he can't sell it because he works for Fender and if he gets caught, he'll get fired, but I can sell it for him and they won't know. If that was a problem, he wouldn't be able to tell the story. He wouldn't be telling a story that could get his friend fired. This is bananas. I don't believe that, that the person who made this works for Fender I don't believe Gosh, this guy's story man. at all. I'm looking I mean, at the, that relic job on the fretboard again. The moment I saw the so finish bad. gunked up and gummed up over the plastic truss rod ring. Yeah. I was like, oh, hell no. Like from a distance when I screen grabbed it on my computer, I was like, oh, someone's doing a relic. Now, now that I look it up, up close, there's no freaking way. I'm one, I kind of wonder like... I, like this, it is looks beyond, like this is beyond orange peel on this finish too and the parts that aren't relics. The parts that are supposed to look unmolested and look clean, Still, like it just looks gunked up. Yeah. The finish is gunked up. 
you're not supposed to start a relic job with a finish that looks like it was done incorrectly. You're supposed to start a relic job with a finish that's done correctly. Right, right. I don't think there's much else to say about this. No, I'm angry enough as it is. On to the next topic. Yeah, this topic was sent by Joshua K. Frazier. It's one of those topics where the person posting it didn't know they were posting a topic. They thought they were just posting something funny to the group. But ha, gotcha. It's a topic now. It says, uh, this was a Craigslist ad that I guess was local for somebody. It says, looking for paid lead guitars for contemporary worship service. So there's a, it's a church in the background. Uh-huh. Requirements, good oral skills, oral, yeah. like hearing, good technique. Manageable number of pedals. I mean, it could be oral skills. It's just not spelled that way. Yeah, that would be weird. Okay, I I trampled all over you saying the punchline of this. I'm sorry. Yes, manageable number of pedals. That's the part we're going to focus on. They are requesting for a player with a manageable amount of guitar pedals. So we're going to discuss, in our own opinions, what is a manageable amount of guitar pedals for a church player. I mean, I, well, I I read this I read this ad, and I'm like something happened at this church. Well, so th- so that's the first thing is if you look at this picture, the guy all the way on the far left in the blue shirt, I'm pretty sure that's an electric guitar player. So I want to know uh, why is he no longer the electric guitar player? I can't tell. I think it is an electric guitar, but I'm having a tough time telling what guitar he's playing. Oh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure either, but the guy in the far back is a bass player. But we can't we can't just assume that that guy is the person who caused the problem. We can't. There was I, that, can, just, we, can we agree that there was a problem? Um, there had to be. There had to be a problem. And this is paid. So that's cool. That's crazy. How do I get lined up for that? (laughs) Someone tell my worship leader that sometimes people get paid. (laughs) Well, only only if they have a manageable number of pedals. I don't actually want to get paid by my church because then they'll start expecting a certain level of performance out of me. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) That's what happens when you get paid. You actually have to, like, produce results. (laughs) Ryan is is a jazz worship musician. Where, Why don't I just play the right notes? Where all of you, everyone else on the team is, just play the right notes. <laughs> oh man! What's a manageable number of pedals? What do you for, think for, this person's perspective is on a manageable? I'm number gonna, of pedals? I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say that the the person who caused problems in the past had too many pedals. But it's also funny to think of a scenario where they didn't have enough. And the worship leader is just like, I can't manage, you, you can't manage to play this if you've only got two pedals and one of them's a tuner. <laughs> like, we need you to have something other than a DS1. You've got to have a delay, too. This, right. this song kind of needs now, a do, little bit of delay. Do you even think the pers- this person had too many pedals or just that they oh, had? Oh, I think for sure they actually, they def- definitely had too or they many. Or ha- they were like fidgeting all the time. I think that was the issue. I don't think, okay, that's a, that I was talking all over you. I'm sorry, Steve. I hope you forgive me in time. Um, yes, I Why think... Why do you keep saying that? I think... I don't remember. I I think that they... I don't think that there's too many pedals to be manageable. It's definitely, can you manage the pedals you have? Right. And the person previously probably had more pedals than they could personally manage. Sure. And they weren't prepared to manage that many pedals. They were probably running into issues with power, mm-hmm. with patch cables failing, because they weren't using sinusoid. Let's just be honest. They probably weren't. They should have been. That would have solved their issues. Uh, <laughs> it's a little bonus sponsor shout out there. Um, they could have been having issues just not knowing how their pedals worked and constantly trying to dial them in or having troubles with their EQ or how their pedals talked with their amp or something like that. Yeah. Or maybe there's someone like me who constantly has new pedals on their board and didn't have them mm. figured out because of that. I'm not saying I don't have my pedals figured out. I'm just saying I could see that problem if you're constantly right. swapping stuff out. I just don't know how to use it. But that being said, I'm just going to say the manageable amount of pedals is uh, 10 to 12. Any more than that is not manageable. Sorry. That's it's... also what Joshua K. Frazier said. Oh, really? Yeah. 10 to 12? He says he feels like 10 to 12 works fine for He says, I feel like 10 to 12 works fine for me. Yeah. Um, I think my board's right around 10 something like that. The thing is, is like, I have a pretty good idea, like where, what I want dialed in. So everything's just off or on yeah. at that point. I feel like anytime you hit the point where you're like, yeah, I definitely need to be making hard decisions and deep thoughts about buffers. I'm like, I'm done. 
That's too many. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I tend to run like 10 to 12, and I feel like with that many, I start hitting redundancy pretty hard. Right. Because I am trying out stuff for demo purposes. You know, people don't always like to hear me talk about the fact that I do demos. Right. Well, but- you do have, like, you do wonder, like, when it says manageable number of pedals, was it that it wasn't manageable or that the guy had, like, a rainbow machine running into a data corruptor? Right. And- or he could have just had, like, you know, like, delay and reverb supercomputers that he hadn't figured out. Right. Like he had a timeline and he had a big sky and he had two even tides and he had a programmable looper mm-hmm. and he just hadn't spent the time to figure it all out. So it was just a big cluster F every time he played. I'd like to think that this guy in or, the picture is the problem, but the issue really wasn't his pedal, it was his choice in pants. Or lack, or thereof. lack thereof. He's got cargo shorts on. Yeah. Mm. Uh, where do you think your line would be for so many pedals that they do become unmanageable for you? Per my personal line? Yeah. It's probably about the same, 10 to 12. But again, like it does have to do with that redundancy. And I, you know, um, I could probably, um, I think I could, you know, I did that episode of of a Keep It Simple Stupid with uh-huh. RJ. I think I could drop down to like four pedals sure. and be fine. I may have to like adjust uh, things from song to song a little bit more. Um, but I think I could pull that off. Um, I mean, I could do everything at church probably with one like mid game drive and one delay. Right. And I would fu- say, I mean, I-, I could do everything at church with just the katana. Sure. Easily, sure. but it's more fun to do it with more. Right. Um, right now, so I I run a, I run a, a a boost, like always as an always on. So you're treating it like, like a preamp sort of thing. Right. I've got a couple drive pedals uh, that I'm using pretty frequently. Um, I don't know what else is on my board right now. I've got a, like a reverb that's always on. Mm-hmm. I've well, no, actually, it's not always on, but it's on a lot especially for like slower songs. I've got a couple delays. So right there, that's already one, two, three, four, five, six. That's like six pedals and plus a volume pedal, plus like a mod, like a, a Swiss army modulation pedal kind of a deal. And, um, you know, so, so I think, yeah, somewhere probably 12 is the max. I, that's actually one of the reasons I try to keep like my, my boards, my pedal board down to like a size of that just fits the exact number of pedals that I need. Yeah. Because otherwise I feel like I have empty space. If you give yourself a really big pedal board, you're going to end up filling it and then you're going to run into all sorts of crazy stuff and crazy problems. There's a guy who plays at my church and I feel like his pedal board is too big. It's he hasn't, he hasn't filled it up, which is part of the problem. Like you don't need Mm. a pedal board this big and you keep complaining about how big and heavy it is Uh because you got this giant flight case and you've got it like two thirds full you just need a smaller pedal board. And if he, he if he filled that thing up, it would be unmanageable. It would be too much stuff. Like right. especially for a church set. I mean, there's already a joke that you're, you know, packing, you know, twelve pedals to play four songs. Right. You know, or five songs in a set. Someone actually uh, teased me about that on that Instagram. You're packing twelve pedals? No, they were like, Oh, you got this many pedals, huh? How many songs is that? And it's right. like, but what, you know, like, well, we, we played, you know, like seven songs and I did two services. So, yeah, it was a pedal per song across two services. I mean, I, you know, it, it all comes down to like, what's your it, pedal it's, per it's song tools. ratio, Steve? Yeah. It's tools, you know, if uh, we're tools, if, if for Jesus, if you're, <laughs> if you're using Amish style construction, you can build a house with like, an entire house with like a hammer and a saw. Yeah. That doesn't mean that's the only way to build a house. You also have a lot, you have to have a lot of Amish people to make that happen. Like I want to, like I'm just picturing like the Amish guy who's like going to a modern construction site and he's like, like a modern like housing development. He's like, oh, how many uh, screwdrivers you need to build this house? I just use a hammer and saw. I built the house. Like as if like that's the de facto only way to use it. Like, you know, you go back to uh, you go back to some old punk band, and they're like pedals. Like they don't even have pedals. Like yeah. Just, and then the flip the way side, I get distortion is I broke my amp. Why don't yeah. you break your amp? 
And then the flip side is like you get the uh, the pedal cabinet that that the edge rolls around with. Yeah, like a big where it's like tower. Where literally, like I think it's there's a chorus pedal somewhere in there that people have asked him like, oh, what's the deal with this chorus pedal? And he's like, oh, I used it on this one song on like the i think like the boy record or whatever uh-huh. or you know one of the what like one of their old every like, time he 80s writes records every time he writes a new song he has to build a new rack unit per, basically that he takes like, on the road like that's that's i mean that's kind of the idea at least with that one he's like yeah i had this pedal and i used it on this song and that's the only song i use it on live but that is the pedal that i recorded with and that's the only pedal that i trust to like get the sound that i want yeah. so that's that's all I use. And so it's just, he's got his ground control or whatever he uses, his big MIDI thing. And there's just a setting that, he, you know, song, whatever number yeah. it is in the set, and it plays it. Half that guy, and this isn't a diss on him, because I think he's a, a darn fine player. Half that guy's musical knowledge is memorizing how, <laughs> like, his, his, like, single right, path goes. Right. Right. <laughs> like how it all goes out of a switcher or something like yeah. that. <laughs> it's like, well, it goes this way and then goes that way and then comes back around and then into the chorus and then over into this other cabinet and then it comes back to the amplifier. <laughs> like, he has to have that memorized for all sorts of stuff. Right. Ridiculous. Should we do the next ad? Yeah, this is a 1955 Airline Archtop electric guitar, modified, not original. It says, guitar was custom modified by me. Vintage electrics with period correct pickup, uh, modified Gibson robot tuners, handmade pit guard, nut and bridge, plays well, sounds nice and grizzly. Nut is set for slide right now, but can be lowered for easier playing. Has a nice straight neck with approximately 1 16th inch relief. See more on Twanger's guitar repair page here on Facebook. Happy to answer questions. We'll ship for guitar junkies pending pay- PayPal payment. Or cleared check. Thanks for reading all the info, Steve. No problem. So we can hear about the PayPal details. When I first saw this ad, the I was PayPal like, payment. That was when I first saw this ad. I was like, "That's an attractive looking guitar for mm-hmm. two fifty. That looks really pretty." And then I read the part about it having Gibson robot tuners, and I was like, "What?" Yeah. So this was sent by what? Jason. Yeah, this was sent by Jason Weiser, and he said. Uh, This has got me feeling things. I really like it. But then they went and used modified Gibson robot tuners, which I read as we took robot tuners off another guitar, got rid of the robot stuff, and reinstalled them on this beauty. Those tuners feel weird, by the way, when you're not using the robot thing. It feels like pushing against a servo. And maybe they don't feel that way once the robot part has been removed. But it's I would guess that they do. Um... This is crazy, right? I don't think they look any more... I don't think they look much more out of place than any modern style closed back tuner is going to look on this guitar. But they look out of place in general because they have that bad robot tuner look to them. They look like a giant... like plastic case wrapped around a tuner like the tuners are way bigger than the tuner needs to be right but i'm saying like and it's also just buck wild to like are we repurposing gibson robot tuners now i know you can sell them as like the whole unit for people who want that for some reason but to be just repurposing them onto like vintage airline like archtop acoustics is crazy right I'm guessing like am I because the crazy I'm one saying here? I'm guessing that because this was from a guitar repair page this was probably somebody who brought in like a Gibson to have it retrofitted or whatever uh-huh. and so the person who did the work was like do you still want this and the guy's probably like eh I'm not going to use it this, so they just kept them this guitar is the embodiment of pineapple pizza like this is the <laughs> pineapple pizza of guitars what does that mean? The, the, the parts don't belong on there. This is almost like a really cool, classy guitar for a really good price. And then it's like, oh, you just threw a bunch of pineapple on there and cooked it. Pineapple on cheese, huh? So here's here's my... Okay, um, maybe I guess if the pineapple was hidden under the cheese. Because when you look at it from the front, you cannot tell that these beautiful are robot tuners. 
So one that would be that. insane if someone made a pizza where they hid pineapple under the cheese. I would die. I would die. I had pineapple pizza like I know just you the other like this stuff. I know you like it. And I know everyone who listens to the tone mob is probably t- type typing right now on the Facebook. How much group. they love you because everyone in that group hates pineapple Good. pizza. Good. Good. I hate pineapple pizza. I also hate feta cheese too. Another pizza Why related would you thing. Pi- Some Wait, people put to... feta on like Italian food. It's gross. Yeah, but I, I like wanna... salads and stuff. Oh, yeah, salad. Okay, fine. I, I was just—I just, a, I just feta... was thinking earlier, like the only way it could be worse was if there was feta cheese on this guitar <laughs> or pizza. So here, so <laughs> I, to an extent, like I—I I I, would for two fifty. I if this was local, and I saw this guitar, I would be tempted. But the robot tuners make me not want to pay over like one seventy five because I know I'm going to want to change those tuners. And it's not because they used to be robotic. It's because they look dumb and I'd want to make this look less dumb. I think I'd need to see it. Because it deserves to look less dumb. I think I would need to see it in person before making that call. I would want to see this in person. This is a beautiful wall hanger. Even I want if it's to a know, good player or not. I really want to know like does it like because in the picture, there's some things about the picture that are just a little odd. Can you tell by the pixels? Um, excuse me. So I think I'd want to see it in person because, I, yeah, they're not period correct, but I think any, any like. I don't think the period matters. I'm just going to say they're not correct. I think any, I still th- will hold like, I think any modern tuner is going to look weird. Like if you threw any set of Grovers sure. on here, it's going to look weird. But there's tuners you could put in there that would not look as weird. Yeah, Cluson Vintage 3 three by 3 I'm going to say it. I think it'd look better with these locking tuners. No, I think it's going to look... I don't think it's going to look better with the graph. It's not. Those aren't even going to work. Those are six in lines. Ryan, it's still, trying to pull a fast one on me. It would still look better. I would, I would put an old set. I would put a correct set of tuners on this to make it look good. There's, yeah, there's, uh, that, obviously that's the best choice. Yeah. And I guess like if this is being sold by the repair shop, like maybe you'd be like, hey, like what if you did this and you just keep those? I don't know. I just think that I think it's a bad move. But I, I, you know, the other side of that on a is guitar. nothing on this guitar is period is like period correct sure like nothing on this guitar is supposed to be there sure it's all just style sure but it looks great except for the tuners this gold hardware doesn't even match the pickup but it looks classy and it looks cool and it looks like it fits the guitar and then you throw like a freaking robot part on there you can't even see that from the front but the person playing it can see it, and that's the most important person. You do you spend a lot of time looking at your tuners when you play? You don't. That's no. all I look at. I just stare at them and stare at them. <laughs> Should we get out of here? Yeah. All right. Thanks again to our sponsors. Uh, you make this show possible. Sinusoid. Also, thanks Gun to uh, our Chase Bliss uh, Audio Patreonages. Our Patreonizers. Um, Thank you for patronizing us. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want Whenever to support I see the pe- show, head on to uh, patreon.com slash. I don't know. I don't know what it I'm is. I'm going to start asking people. 60 cycle hum. In the cast. inner circle, the people who are patronizing us, I'm going to ask them, are you patronizing me? Are you patronizing me? And then they'll say, yes, I am. I'm like, I know. That's why you're here. All right. Uh, this song was sent in by Gerard uh, Becker. Uh he says, hi, guys. I really enjoy the podcast and decided to submit one of my band songs for the podcast. We are a South African-based alternative grunge band. Cool. We mainly use a Fender Coronado and a J-Mask's Jazz Master and do a bunch of software plugins for the sound. The band is called M- Miyagi. There's a Miyagi? lot of letters there that I don't that don't really seem to make sense. Miyagi? Um, and this song is called High Hopes. High Hopes? High Hopes. Cool. Can't wait to hear it when I edit this episode. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye.